I think now we are going to dive into the more winemaking oriented part of the season, starting at, uh, really it starts at, at food set. So we've looked at the winter slash early springtime period. We looked at the burst in terms of litharal development. And typically, in order to compare uh, different sites, we set uh, July 15 as the, the mid veraison date, so that there are different ways of characterizing veraison. Typically, it's related to the level of resistance to uh, deformation of, of the, the berries. We start to look at it in terms of uh, what I call chemical time, the moment in time when we have half of the sugar expected to be filling into the berries. I found that it was a nice way to really compare site to site. And sometimes it's hard to define the raison, but if you look at the amount of uh, sugar to fool the berry halfway through its uh, complete uh, sugar concentration, uh, it's, it's an interesting way to do it. And it's, it was around July 15, in, at least in Paso Robles, through the few sites that we've monitored. So typically at this stage, I like to look at how 2014 relates to previous vintages. So as I was saying in introduction, it's the first time we uh, do that in Paso Robles. So unfortunately, I do not have many historical uh, maturation profile to give some perspective. However, we found something from Hitchburg to, to Cupertino across all the sites that I believe has no reason to not have happened here if we would have had historical data. And that's the following thing. Here you track uh, bricks according to time. And you see that typically we like to track the onset of sugar accumulation by sampling our berries even when they are still green. Because we want to see this uh, inflection point from which sugar starts to be accumulated at a very, very fast rate. And then around uh, mid-sugar uh, loading, you see that there is a decline in the speed at which sugar accumulates, and then it plateaus. So if you look at the three last vintages, you see that basically, in the earliest vintage, uh, the sugar accumulation onset started after July 15, and we reached the, the plateau sometime at the end of August, sometime middle of September. What was drastically different uh, in 2014, is that the onset of sugar accumulation started before the end of June. And by middle of July, we were already halfway through uh, the sugar loading of the berries. And the plateau was reached uh, at the end of July. So this shift towards the left is reminiscent of the earlier shift towards the left we were discussing regarding the moment when peak area was being reached. So here you see there is a, a, nice, a, a nice, an interesting point to correlate the dynamic of leaf area development with the dynamic of sugar accumulation to the berry. So what does it mean for us in the field? That means that if you're interested in tracking when your sugar stops being actively accumulated into the berries, and if you're tracking when your block starts to go onto a reproductive mode, because that's what it means, right? When, when sugar starts to be accumulated, the plant is trying to call for, for birds or for whatever is going to help the food to be carried away into a different niche. Well, early maturing block, I think, is a very interesting information to have as a winemaker, because the early maturation block are probably going to be the one you may want to harvest earlier or later, depending upon the production objectives, but I think this information, this onset, is an important information to have, which means that if you believe also that it's interesting not only to have where your food is uh, maturing when you are on the plateau phase, but if you're more interested in the trajectory of your food maturation, you should start sampling not only middle of July, but probably end of June to make up for the global warming. So I thought that was an important point to really uh, push forward. Uh, in terms of uh, sugar, uh, again, uh, if we look at different blocks, uh, that's what I, I wanted to show to you. So you see that um, we call it a, a sigmoidal curve because it 
roughly look like a S shaped curve. And you see that the most important changes happened between June 30 and July 15. So again, I'm trying to uh, convey the message that a lot of very important stuff is happening in terms of fruit maturation during those two first week of July. And that was last year when the weather was relatively less warm than this year. So for me, if you're interested in, in tracking the trajectory, it's not a bad idea to be ready for your first sampling by the end of June. So that's the, the take home message num number four, and I'm looking at my note here. So start sampling early if you are interested in tracking the earlier onset of sugar accumulation, because if the sugar accumulation starts earlier, the stop of sugar accumulation will also appear earlier, as early as early August. Uh, if you start monitoring later, what you're going to monitor with your sometimes expensive analytical samples is just the impact of heat wave at dehydrating your fruit or rehydrating your fruit. You're not going to monitor what's happening intrinsically into the plant. You're just going to look at how the fruit is reflective of variations in the climatic demand. It's also important, but it's not helping you linking the plant and the fruit or it helping you less. Um, what it means also, and that's going to be critical to introduce gene talk, because sugar accumulation starts earlier and stops earlier, the polyphenolic maturation will happen under warmer and longer days. So the photo period is going to be more important. So the interplay between light and skin coloration will be much more extreme. And same thing with temperature. We have warmer days, therefore the speed at which anthocyanins, carotenoids, any type of flavonoids are going to mature is going to be negatively or positively impacted by those warmer temperatures. So keep in mind that because of global warming, well, the fruit is going to mature under more extreme climatic conditions. And hopefully Jim will, will shed some more light on, on that aspect. Speaking about heat wave, what uh, I like to look at is a uh, vapor pressure deficit. Vapor pressure deficit measures how, uh, at the same time, how dry and how warm it is when you step outside. It's a little bit telling you how close you are into uh, being in an oven when you are stepping outside. When the VPD, vapor pressure deficit, increases above 4 kilopascal, it means that the pressure that the air is having on sucking water out of the leaf starts to be so strong that, regardless of your stomatal conductance, water is going to leave the plant even through, through the leaf tissue itself, because the leaf tissue is not completely waterproof. So when we get above 4 kilopascal, what we think we know about a very subtle water regulation may no longer hold true, just because the water is going to be lost through, through the whole uh, tissues, which translates with a peak in vine water use, which translates into some very odd phenomenon because you think you're going to protect your plants from warming too much by irrigating during a heat wave, but what's going to happen is that all the water you're going to apply is going to be immediately transpired or lost through the plant. So when the heat wave is over, then your root reservoir has been completely emptied. And you may think that you've been covering your plant water needs. Actually, what happened is that you underestimated the severity of the climatic demand and then your ability at refilling the plant with enough water. And consequently, after the heat wave, you see your brinks rising up. So that means that you need to account for that by either applying water before heat wave, and I'm talking large amount of water to make up for the extra uh, demand in climate, or, right after the heat wave, thinking that the root reservoir has been zeroed again. And your irrigation that used to protect your vine water needs for one week is no longer applicable. So, keep in mind VPD. And VPD events were particularly significant from the period stretching from July 15 until September 15 in 2014. And even more, if we look here only at the period stretching from September 15 to uh, October 15, you see that we had a heavy toll on VPD. So when VPD is high, that's when your fruit turns like fig, pruny flavors because the fruit shrivels on the plant. 
simply because it's physical. The, the, the food cannot keep the moisture inside because the skin is not waterproof. So deciding you have a state according to the occurrence of VPD is, is an important parameter to factor in. And I think it's a very important factor to describe what makes a vintage the way it is. So whether you were harvesting before September 15 or after September 15 will have a major impact on whether or not the food was hit by those nine heat waves. And again, uh, Jim Kennedy is going to speak probably on, with more detail on how that affected the secondary metabolites. So before we dive into the secondary metabolite, I'd like to take one step back and looking at the big picture. I've been talking on how uh, it was counterintuitive that despite the drought, we could actually apply less water. I want now to provide you with hard data to make up my point. So what happened is that the, the Water District uh, Agency of Los Angeles um, was participa participating in a project that um, we were recipient of in order to incentivize farmers to use less water in the northern part of California. Because as you know, uh, Los Angeles being the number one purchaser of water in the world, um, any uh, water savings in the northern part of California could potentially impact water supply in South California. And you have also to know that 80% of water use in the state of California is dedicated to agriculture. So when you try to save water in a urban environment, one drop of water saved in a city is not so much a big deal, whereas one drop of water saved in an agricultural context is four times more efficient. So that's why the incentive is very strong, and that's why we need to think all together about the ways to be more uh, organized as far as distributing smartly uh, water use. For that reason, we got a project where uh, in uh, six different wineries spread from Paso Robles up to Hillsburg, we applied uh, a split treatment. The split treatment consisted of comparing traditional irrigation technique versus plant-based irrigation technique. In traditional irrigation technique, the farmer, the winemaker, irrigates the way he always did, mainly based on visual cues and its empirical knowledge of the plant and how many years he has been working the vineyard. With a plant-based irrigation technique, we apply uh, those sensors on the plant and they help us monitoring the level of vinewater need satisfaction. So how does this work? We actually wrap this heater along the path where water is flowing. So I was telling you, we look at the plant as if it was a bunch of um, piping system together. So inside this heater strip, there are uh, thermocouples. So we can actually monitor the temperature as the slab enters the, slab enters the, the heater strip and monitor the temperature after the sap has been heated. So when the sap goes very, very fast, the temperature difference before and after the heating um, period is very small. When the sap goes very, very slowly, it takes a lot of time to be heated and the temperature difference between the cold sap and the heated sap is much, is much larger. Therefore, we can correlate a temperature difference with an amount of water actually flowing through the plant. So that's what we did. And when the amount of water flowing through the plant declines, we trigger an irrigation. The way uh, we do that was by basically imposing before the raison a level of water uh, needs satisfaction that tolerated a drop of 60%. So we allowed the plant to be thirsty until only 40% of its water needs were satisfied. And then that was a call, a threshold to trigger an irrigation after the raison 60%. Okay, so we, we force the plant into being thirsty by monitoring the amount of water flowing through the plant. In order to be sure that we were not um, wrong, we actually attached under each dripper a gauge to really monitor what went into the root zone with what traveled through the plant. And we kept monitoring those sites throughout the season. And what was surprising is and I'm talking about sites where people already have a practice of being rather conservative. 
on average, they were uh, using 60 millimeters of water. 60 millimeters of water, um, I think, in inches, that's uh, 2.4 inches. Okay, so that's traditional irrigation. In our experimental uh, sites, this is on average how much we spent, less than uh, one inch, 0.9 inches to be precise. So, and, and you see, I also reported the standard deviations. So it's, it's a major water savings that was done in the context of a drought. So obviously the next question is, wow, you must have impacted leaf area, you must have impacted yield. How did you impact yield? Well, surprisingly, we did not impact the yield, and that was confirmed over many sites as the standard deviation showed. Why? Because we just overestimate how much water a plant needs. And that ties back with what Lars was saying earlier, or what Martin was alluding earlier. We can overcompensate by applying too much water too early. That's how in 2014, Martin was showing uh, vineyards that were looking greener than in 2013. So that's only uh, what we tapped on. And that's why the yield were the same. And actually, the yield average is slightly higher. That seems a surprise because we reduced the water by 60% and the yield is slightly higher. Well, it's because by refraining from irrigating early, we think we are inducing a hormonal balance that's favorable to um, the resilience of the berry to heat waves. What it means is that a vine that grew a fruit after having been used to not having a lot of water is probably floating a lot of abscisic acid into its sap. And abscisic acid helps the vine regulating better its water use. So we think that's why uh, berries are less uh, sensitive to uh, sudden shriveling, which translates with an average uh, yield that's slightly higher. Keep in mind, uh, those differences are not significant. So the big picture is that the yield was not affected. But in some situations, we had a higher yield. Yes? Uh, what so the, the question is, in order to have those results, what were the vineyard performances expected by the, the winemakers? I'd say those sites were rather on the qualitative side. And you see that no uh, traditional vineyard was performing at more than three tons an acre. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I don't think it would work. Uh, I, I don't know, for, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 yeah, and, and that's why I insisted so much with Lars, asking him how much water was applied. And Lars was applying more than, I think it's four times more water, right, Lars? Yeah, so, and the yield was uh, twice as high with last examples. We are on the other extreme. We are applying four times less water, but the yield is, is, is twice or twice lower. Yeah. Some of those vineyards, at least in one of these vineyard participants, mm -hmm. the bottle price is, is $20, but the rest was higher. Okay, so I thought that was an amazing result, particularly in a time where we think of smart way to reduce water, water use. Then uh, sugar. I looked at sugar per berry because of this uh, ever existing question of, okay, you, you have more bricks or the same level of bricks, but it's because you have dehydration. No, we did not see dehydration because when we look at the quantity of sugar on a per berry basis, you see it's between uh, 200, so that's in, it's 210 or 215 uh, milligrams per berry. So same levels, which obviously translated with bricks, with same bricks, 24.4 versus 24.7. Okay, so I thought I wanted to put that uh, forward because I was very surprised that we could, I was expecting uh, more uh, yield reduction or something affecting the speed at which uh, sugar was going to be accumulated. And it seems that the very critical part is to not uh, drop the ball after the raison. That's after the raison that really you could 
negatively impact the fruit maturation. But before the raison, it seemed that we could have a major uh, effect on saving water, 60%. And that's an average. In some sites, we could dry farm. So all those vineyards were planted anywhere between 97 and 2003. Vine was established, the root system was established. That's right. So the, the, those uh, vineyards, uh, unlike uh, Lars uh, vineyards, they started irrigation on June 1st. So the, the period that is being covered here was from June 1st until harvest. So that was the, the last take home message I wanted to, to convey. Um, I'm just going to summarize um, what I really wanted to, <coughs> to, <laughs> to communicate is that reducing water is possible even in the times of, of drought and it does not affect negatively sugar accumulation rate. Um, the, the panel of the winemaker later on will discuss any potential impact on food quality because here I'm just talking about primary metabolite and yield. What about flavors, wine, wine balance, you know, sugar versus acidity, things like that. Uh, hopefully we'll let the winemakers uh, speak up for, for that. Um, but I, I, I took a quote from one of the participants of this um, experience and he said that no yield difference were seen even if one would have expected that more dehydration would have occurred in the experimental treatment. And physiological maturity level was actually preferred uh, where the experimental treatment happened. So with less water, it seemed like the vine was helped into its maturation. And for me, it, it kind of makes sense because if you think in terms of evolutionary basis, a plant that feels the stress coming from the environment has a greater incentive to be very sexy, to be very appealing, to be transported to a different biotopes. So the fruit has to keep a tasty flavor to have statistically more chance to be carried away by a bird into a different location. So by saving water before the raison, you induce the vine onto a more reproductive pathway earlier. And that's how I, I remember that, that, that model. I, I may be off, but because we've seen that across many, many sites, not only those experimental worlds in 2014, I think we can do some major savings in June and July when the cities need it by playing with that plant response, which plays to our benefit because as winemakers, we pursue the same goal that birds are, are pursuing. We, we want color, we want flavors, we want sugar and, and acid. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kennedy to explain the link between uh, polyphenols and, and maturation, how earlier and faster maturation will impact the food composition when uh, environmental conditions are more extreme. 